And my name is Ichim and I will be serving as the moderator. And my name is Akabayashi. I will also be moderator. So first of all, uh, we would like to ask Professor Heckman to respond to some of the questions by the discussants. You respond. Okay. <laughs> okay, I want to thank the discussants. I'll just make a brief response because I'd like to ha open this for further discussion. Uh, let me argue, I mean, let me thank both discussants because they've made some very nice points and I want to just respond and compliment uh, them uh, in, in both two senses of the word compliment, uh, in the sense they gave good comments and also that I think I can make work that supplements it. So let me just go through the, uh, uh, the, the two comments in the order they were given. So first of all, with Professor Tachibanaki's uh, comments. And uh, the issue about fam familial instability, I think, is clearly a factor of modern society. Uh, and it's a, modern, it's a feature of modern society around the world. So I don't think we can really argue that this trend can be reversed. And I think we actually really need to understand that the family is under challenge, and that we can think of policies that supplement the family and make the family more effective in the light of these changes that have occurred. So for example, single parent families, which are still not a huge issue in, in Japan, but they're increasing, those can be supplemented. That's not a suggestion of replacing the family or using the government to somehow take the job of the family, but it's suggesting that you can aid the family. You can aid it in several ways. One way is to essentially promote the, uh, uh, give them the knowledge to essentially uh, deal and maybe even change their parenting style. Secondly, you can change the resource in the sense of the time that they might have available and the resources that are available. So if a mother's working, uh, for example, uh, the working mother can place the child in a daycare center that can be viewed as a, not just a place to warehouse the child, but a place where the child would gain education and benefit. And there'd be a sense that perhaps because of the social background of the mother compared to the childcare workers, that the childcare center may actually provide supplementary information. But important, and I think it's very important to understand that these policies that I'm talking about and that have been most effective are not replacing the mother, they're kind of engaging the mother and giving the mother greater resources and maybe teaching uh, and, and, and providing the child with greater resources <coughs> so the child and the mother can engage in a more productive relationship. So it changes the nature of the interaction and it gives a child back to the mother who's actually more motivated and capable of learning. So you see more motivated children emerging from these centers. Now this issue that was raised, the second point that was raised in your comment is the issue about the myth of the child under three. And there's a huge debate about whether working women are good or bad for children. But I'll just throw out a fact that's been found at least in the United States. I don't know if it's been found in time use surveys in Japan. And that is that more educated women are working more than they ever have in the past. And there's a trend. More educated women are working more. But at the same time, it's also the case that more educated women are actually spending more time in child development. So it's not an either or situation. I mean, maybe this comes out of the leisure time of the mother. But the fact of the matter is, because of the enhanced knowledge of, uh, of, of, of the importance of the early years and of the parent-child relationship, that many more educated women are the ones who actually devote more time, not less time. And so even working will not necessarily mean an impaired child development. And if the child substitute, the mother surrogate, the parent substitute while the mother's at work is of high quality, there's no necessary loss. So I'm not sure that these two schools, there might, might, might be a third school uh, in Japan, right? <laughs> the third school would suggest that maybe you can actually have your cake and eat it too. That you can actually then, by providing high quality daycare, allow women to work, improve children, and especially for the families, children from disadvantaged environment, there may be a real socioeconomic gain in the sense of giving them skills. So I think that's an issue. Now, th there's a third question. I know that, uh, and this was raised by both discussants, uh, about the problem of outside school education. That's a huge source of inequality in, uh, in uh, Japan. It's also true, I think in J Korea they call it hagwon. Uh, and so there is a, and it's a very uh, pronounced uh, problem where children from more advantaged environments are getting the excellent, 
extra education. They're working hard, they're being promoted. But that's exactly what childcare centers can do. That's exactly what essentially a, an enriched environment can do, is can provide the supplementary material that, the, that is shown up in the Juku uh, system that can actually show up in the Hagwan system so that you can supplement the life of the children. So I don't think it's necessarily uh, uh, at odds. I would argue that, in fact, this is a form of outside family education. So it's not outside school. What you want to do is engage the parent, the other resources available to the parent, including the daycare, and the school to try to work together. So I don't see it as a necessary uh, problem. I, but I do see that it is a problem. And it's a big contribution to inequality right now in the provision of education. Um, and then the issue about low public expenditure for education in Japan. Well, uh, there's an issue. Uh, uh, and that is, uh, what should be the source of the expenditure? Uh, and where, who should support this group? It didn't, shouldn't necessarily only be a government-provided program. It might also engage private sector. In the United States, companies, uh, private firms, uh, cultural organizations, and churches are actually playing an important role. Um, but I do think that it has to be emphasized that educational policy, in this broader sense that I'm talking about, has a very high economic and social return. And what people haven't yet understood in terms of policy is that the government can itself save money and reduce crime, reduce costs of health, reduce uh, uh, issues that arise across the board, includes social participation and voting and in democracy. So that I think we can see it if we broad, think of a much broader and more inclusive aspect of what education is producing and we actually and, and there is work doing this, trying to look at the benefits of education and preschool education across the board, that we will see that there are huge economic benefits. 8% a year is a very, 7 or 8% a year is a very high economic rate of return, and the government will capture that. And I would argue that return is underestimated because none of the returns so far has actually captured the benefits of health. So I would say that that's one way is to make the case of how that social benefits percolate across the whole spectrum of the life cycle. Now, uh, my colleague, Kaz Yamaguchi, <laughs> I appreciate his comments. I drew on some of his research. Actually, I didn't know that you were my discussant when I used your paper, uh, <laughs> but I, I see that was a good strategy now. Um, but uh, so you ask the question, is this a form of human capital? Uh, yes, the notion of non-cognitive skills being very important. Uh, and it's a dimension that people have talked about since the beginning of the early human capital movement. The people have talked about these skills of social and emotional skills. Uh, but I think what we really need to understand is that until recently, we didn't think we could measure those skills. And economists and psychologists working together have created ways to go about measuring these skills, making them feasible tools for public policy, for evaluation, for targeting, for essentially improvement of, of educational programs. Um, now, you ask about the functional dependence of non-cognitive skills. Um, well, yes, and this is one thing I completely agree with, and that is uh, that skills, I mean, in, in life, people do many different tasks. And, and there's a very basic principle in economics of comparative advantage. So some tasks require certain skills, other tasks require other skills. And they require them to different degrees and different proportions. And people have these skills to different degrees and different proportions. And so what we can do then is essentially recognize that some people may be better at certain trades, tasks, than other tasks, and we allow people to sort. So there isn't like there's a universal trait or a set of tasks that we want everybody to perform. We might want to be able to give people the skills to perform what their genetic endowments and their other, what, they, what are given to them by God, by nature, uh, these things uh, we can build on. But we are going to recognize that there are skills that would talentify people for some. And we should allow the schools to think about this. Schooling should not just be promoting pure cognition. It should be adjusting people to the workplace, to thinking about how people can adjust to the job to be more productive. So a very important feature of any kind of educational system is recognizing that vocational education is not just a dumping ground. Apprenticeship, practical education plays a very, very important role, especially in applying technology and making it operative in the workplace. And that's, I think, a, 
uh, gives us a broader view of the educational process. And now you've raised some very general questions about how productive personalities are nurtured in society. And I completely agree. There's been this, there's been this interaction. I mean, think about it. A hundred years ago, we didn't even have an IQ test. I think the first IQ test was around, around 1950 in any wide scale. Um, now, a hundred years later, modern society has adapted to that. The curriculum of schools has adapted to that. The curriculum of the entire... Uh, um, uh, of the whole society is divine tools. And because of that, we actually see substantial improvements in, in what we've used to think of as IQ or some notions of cognitive skills because there's been an enhanced emphasis in this. So there's a dynamics here of how society is producing these skills and reacting to the availability of these school skills. And that creates a great opportunity. I mean, people talk about the aging society in Japan. What, what Japan can do and what many countries can do is essentially replace bodies with skills. And having a highly skilled population will mean then that you have then an ability to perform output, to produce output, even with less physical input, but much more of a human capital output. So I would argue that there is, uh, yes, a lot of uh, socially adaptive personalities that aren't necessarily economically uh, productive personalities. I'm not sure I completely understood what you meant by that. But I would say for sure, there's a whole literature, right, that somehow they, my wife calls them the Me Too generation, the, 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 you know, the immediate gratification versus long run notion, uh, that I think we can essentially instill basic values and those can play a role in shaping people to stay on tasks. In the US, uh, Angela Duckworth has been popularizing the idea of grit, persistence, and staying on the task, and showing that children who have greater persistence are achieving greater success in life. And so in that sense, I think we can essentially combat what might be negative attitudes. But I think it's also the case, and here's where I just make a qualification to your study, that the school itself, if viewed as an institution that's kind of separated from the rest of society, is almost guaranteed to create a pathology. My, uh, one of your colleagues, our friend uh, James Coleman, who was a sociologist at Chicago until he died about some 20 years ago, wrote a very famous book called The Adolescent Society. And he pointed out that at least the secondary school in the United States was a fairly recent phenomenon. 150 years before, what did people gain? How did they gain their skills? It wasn't the same high skill base, but they gained it by workplace interactions. People learn skills by a form of apprenticeship. They learned, so Abraham Lincoln learned law by being an apprentice at a law firm, not by going to law school. That kind of training and mentoring plays a very important role. It motivates students to acquire certain attitudes. It teaches attitudes. It gives them this notion of mentoring. And I think it provides the children with tremendous opportunities for creating a, a, a life that is actually more productively adapted. Now, I'm not suggesting that all children should be made to go to work in a factory or do some, but I do think the integration of school and work the integration, and this is what Dewey talked about, many leading educators, is extremely important notion. And again, preschool human capital, so I, you, I'm not trivializing your point, uh, you've made some other points. I think though the question about whether the home is better than the caretaker, which was another one of your points, what should be the mixture? Well, it's not a question of replacing the home, it's supplementing the home. That's the point I was making earlier. I think um, that when we think about effective strategies, we think about strategies that target, and I say target, disadvantaged families. So there are many families that are highly advantaged where these programs are not really that effective. A very productive middle class mother who's highly educated, highly motivated, can really do a much better service probably in training her child in the preschool years than somebody who's uh, uneducated or educated at a moderate level. But for more disadvantaged families, that's not obvious. There can be real gains, right? And so I think that's, that's the notion that we might want to think about targeted daycare services that essentially supplement the family and, and target in a way. Uh, but I think then uh, we're not necessarily in conflict. And this is where I think it's very important. When people talk about early childhood programs, they see a conflict between the family life and the, and, and, and the role of government. I don't think there has to be any conflict. I think what's happening here is we're supplementing the role of the family by essentially uh, supplementing the family and providing these programs on a voluntary basis and making, I think most parents mean better, the best for their children. 
I, I better stop sh talking here. I'm going to take up the whole question and answer period. Um, but I would say that there is, uh, yes, that I certainly agree that the home, especially in disadvantaged homes, is not necessarily a good environment. And I think we can supplement it, but we can make, we can improve those environments. That's the important thing. It's not that these environments are fixed. So in the United States, in some of the programs that have been like the Nurse Family Partnership Program, very disadvantaged mothers, teenage mothers, many very uneducated, typically teenage mothers, are told not to drink, not to smoke while they're carrying the child. They're taught to do certain things. And those activities then uh, change the behavior of the mother towards the child. And in some sense, produce the greatest effect by staying, by creating a new and enhanced home environment with the child over the rest of the life of the child in a much more effective way. So family background is important. Uh, I think that we can think about family background as something that we can change. It's not that there are good parents and bad parents. There are some ignorant parents. Recent research shows that many parents don't have a clue about how to deal with certain kinds of problems with children and so forth and so on. By providing that information, by giving guidance, we can actually help both parent and child. And in that sense, reduce the burden on government and think of us as a voluntary participation that engages all parties instead of replaces one party with another. So I completely agree that, uh, I, that the, I, you're quoting this statistic, which I used as well, that among the single parent families in Japan, there's a very high notion of poverty, very high level of poverty. But what I think hasn't been measured and is extremely important to measure, it's not just the money income, because that gives you back to the alms to the poor strategy. You want to think also about the parents providing, changing the nature of the parenting environment, which is not just a matter of money. It's also a matter of style. Poor parents, parents with very poor resources financially, can still be very excellent parents by encouraging the child, by protecting the child, and by promoting the child. So I think we want a broader view of poverty and what we think of these interventions might do. And so that's where we think, we have to think of a more nuanced view. Just like I was saying, we need to think about solving problems from a general approach of improving capabilities. We might also want to think about improving the capability of parents and improving the capability of children and thinking that poverty may be more than just a matter of money, that it's really a matter of advantage. So some of the very poor people some of the very poorest families are some of the richest families, too, in terms of providing family environment. In the United States, we've had many immigrant families that come to the United States with almost no resources whatsoever, very poor, but highly valuing education, highly valuing children's attainment, highly valuing uh, the importance of interacting and protecting the child and encouraging the child. And then the next generation, those children have prospered even though there's been great poverty. It wasn't that they received a lot of income, it was that they received a lot of parenting. So I would put that on the table for public policy discussion. So, sorry, that's a long-winded answer. You probably didn't want me to, I'll shut up now, yes. I would like to entertain questions from the floor. We have a lot of interesting questions from the floor as well. But uh, before we do so, Dr. Professor Tachibanaki and Professor Yamaguchi, do you have any questions? Uh, of course, there are a lot of reasons that the, people, uh, the children are handicapped because of the p poor family background, and because of parenting, poorness, and so forth. Is it f the effective targeting possible, or as in Finland, we, the, the support for the, the care and the, and the education may be provided for every children instead of uh, uh, targeted children? And of course, the latter option is more costly, but at the same time, it's, it's avoid the issue of what's fair for uh, selective, supporting selective uh, uh, children and also uh, the effectiveness of it, identifying most critical, uh, the, the families, uh, children which, who need most critical needs for uh, sort of support. Well, I think the, the, the analysis that's actually appeared in the, uh, of all the programs has been the most effective programs have been those targeting towards disadvantaged children where disadvantaged children mean some aspect of parental environment, background, sometimes income, but also in terms of parenting stuff. And so I think we have the capacity to go part way towards providing much more effective interventions that are targeted towards those children where the interventions 
are, are effective instead of just providing universal. There's a lot of, uh, I think what I would, what economists would call dead weight, where if you essentially then provide the universal education, uh, it's not really as good as, and, and if provided on a voluntary basis, might not even be accepted by uh, parents uh, uh, to the same extent that it would be among more disadvantaged families. But as a political gesture, if that becomes more politically palatable in Japan, I can't speak about politics in Japan. I've been in the country three days, so <laughs> I can't offer myself as an expert. That it, you could provide universal care, but provide targeting, provide basically a sliding fee schedule so that more advantaged parents then pay for this. And they could sort themselves out. Do I want to buy this service or not? So make it universal, don't stigmatize, but then make sure that uh, they can opt out. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's necessary, I think that actually the evidence is pretty strong that targeting is important. And now you raise a good point, do we know exactly what the right targets are? But increasingly we do. And I think, and, but it isn't just poverty. It isn't just money income. It's a, it's a more general view of what poverty is. And I think that, but that requires some work, and I agree. And I think in terms of the Japanese data resources, you're probably going to need much more detail from a governmental standpoint to go beyond just income statistics to target the kind of poverty I'm talking about. But that's been done, and that's being done in the U.S. We can see that, and it's being done in Canada. In Canada now, there are these family readiness inventories which do target families that are at risk. And there are middle-class families that do that. So it isn't just a matter of income. So it isn't just that some, somehow it's low-income families. But it's not all high-income families need it. It's that this kind of notion of what a disadvantaged family is needs to be broadened to us in daily sense. So I think there's some capacity. Thank you very much. Inviting uh, questions from uh, the floor. Professor Kabayashi, thank you for all the questions written on the paper. I have tried to select some uh, questions. We shall try to accommodate as many questions as possible. Uh, please uh, forgive us that probably we will go beyond the time allocated by 10 minutes uh, for a newborn baby until the elderly person. Is there a universal measurement of skills? Uh, can you give us the most advanced measurement knowledge that can be applied from a newborn to the most elderly person to measure their skills? Testing, testing. This is the English Channel. Testing, testing. Testing, testing. This is the English Channel. Can you hear? Professor, can you hear? Testing, testing. The um, measurable uh, ability, the measures that can be used from the birth to uh, the uh, old age uh, consistently. Um, is there any um, measurement system, right, measurement system, system that can be used for practice and research? That you're aware in, of in the, in the front that is in the frontier of the research yeah. area. Yes, th this is an active area of research. And the new OECD report is going to talk about some of these measurements of both cognitive and non-cognitive skills. But one thing that's very effective, and this is something that I think can be applied in Japan, and it's certainly being applied in the US now, is that the data that school systems ordinarily collect information on behaviors. So I didn't really get into this today, but all these psychological measures, and this is where economists have contributed to the work of psychologists, I think, although I'm not sure that psychologists are all that happy with <laughs> the contribution, but that's another story. Uh, and that is that when we look at school behaviors, and we look at behaviors, like you know the way that children are responding to each other, the way that teachers are evaluating students on a routine basis, those turn out to be very good predictors and very good ways to diagnostics of behavior of children. And in that sense, we have these measurement systems that are being refined that move beyond just kind of big five questionnaires and the kind of standard psychological inventories. At the same time, those psychological inventories are actually being uh, provided to, uh, ah, yes, okay, if you could. Thank you, that's uh, good, that works. Okay, thank you, okay, yeah. Um, that those, uh, <clears throat> oh, I might have been putting the wrong earplug on. <laughs> oh, wait, I think this probably works. Sorry. That's a, that's testing, testing, this is the English Channel. Testing, testing, this is the English Channel. Uh, so anyway, what I'm suggesting is the inventories are under preparation. Mm -hmm. But the administrative school records can be used. See, 
Psychologists like to think they have certain measures. Economists develop measures too. All psychological measures are performance on a task. If you standardize the performance on the task for the incentive on the task, some tasks are more oriented towards pure cognition. So one task that is frequently taken, it's been taken by all of us, is an IQ test. We take an, but an IQ test itself is just another task. It partly matters on how, in how much we believe, the, how, how much effort we put in answering the question, or we think it's a dumb test, or it, it's, we're motivated. What the environment is, so you could take a test in a room in which the, there was a jackhammer going off in the background, and somebody was being murdered in the back of the room, and that would change your score, I suspect, tremendously. So you want to standardize for incentives, and that's not what's done in a lot of the psychological measures. <clears throat> And it's also true that virtually every task requires both cognitive and non-cognitive skills. So when we think of tasks, and this is what is being developed now, and I hope more is developed, is we develop tasks-based measures that correct for the environment and the incentives to perform that task and the other traits that are important. And so this then suggests that you know, there's no absolute standard here, but that's also true for the psychological measures, right? So I come along and say, am I conscientious? Well, I mean, if you're looking at me and I'm a student, I'm going to be, and if you ask me, am I conscientious, and I'm a student or somebody applying for a job, I'm going to say, yes, of course I'm conscientious. Do I get along easily with others? I'm applying for a job, I'm going to say, of course. So then a, a measure like that can also be badly targeted. So I think looking at behaviors plays a very important role, and it's a much better way to think about how you can extract those measures. And, and it turns out that in routine school evaluations, evaluations at work by supervisors and others, that we actually have measures of behaviors. And those can be used as very good measures over the whole life cycle. So I would argue that we need to think of more task-based measures. But the psychologists resist. So even economists moving in here will say, ah, this is what the psychologists have done. I've been around long enough, and I have a kind of a deep suspicion of just about everything. <laughs> so I actually think, well, maybe what we should do is kind of ask, are these tests the best tests? And I don't think they do capture all these other measures. And we do have task-based measures. We can look at how children are performing in schools, how workers are performing in the workplace, how people are performing in the Army. There are a lot of different measures that we have that are based on performance on tasks that give us measures of these traits over the whole life cycle. So, but it's an active area, and that's discussed in the new uh, OECD report that's coming out. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Testing, testing. So let us move on to the second question. How about uh, low performance parents may have low parenting skills? So parents with preschool children, if their capability is not high, how can we induce them to accept intervention? How can we access them? What, do you have any examples in the United States? What if the parents reject intervention? Aspects to your question, and the first is that the, uh, I would argue that most parents, but certainly not all, are very willing to try to make their children's lives better than their own or certainly improve their children's lives. I'm sure and I know that there are parents who don't feel that way, children abusing children, they're, 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 uh, uh, parents abusing their own children. But I also think that uh, we have to think of not just parents who are good parents or bad parents, but there are a lot of aspects of these kinds of interventions that change the nature of parenting itself, that give parents information. So Flavio Cunha has done some work with very disadvantaged children at the University of Pennsylvania at the medical hospital with some anthropologists and uh, epidemiologists. And he's found that there's basic ignorance among many parents about what good strategies are for promoting reading, for promoting writing, and for encouraging the child to work with. I put up a graph from, uh, uh, from uh, Hart and Risley, but there's also work by Anne Fernald, as you point out, uh, Kaz, uh, which uh, do documents the same point that uh, the environment in which the child operates varies greatly across disadvantaged and less advantaged children. 
So for example, in an environment, in an intervention that I'm engaged with right now, uh, uh, which was actually started, which is originally pioneered in Jamaica, and is now being applied to Western China, so the left behind children in, in Western China, uh, in Gansu in particular, uh, but you're gonna be as a, pro, as a pilot for a larger program. P caretakers, people, or interveners, are coming in one hour a week into the life of children. So in Jamaica, one hour a week, teaching the mother ways to play with the child, encourage the child, using materials that are available in the child's environment. So the Jamaican study, which is being now replicated by uh, Razio Anatanasio and Costas McGeer in Colombia and in India, and is now being also applied in, adapted to China. And these are all much less advantaged environments than Japan. That that one hour a week intervention, when randomly assigned and then followed in, us, in the case of our Jamaican study for 25 years, we found that children where the parenting style had changed, and you saw the greater warmth, greater working of parent with the child, that that actually had effects on the child's wages uh, that led to 25% higher wages and participation in the market employment went up dramatically. Uh, in Jamaican context, that led to the children who received the intervention. This is one hour a week. What did it do? It actually changed the nature of the parenting style. And it taught the mother how that she could stimulate the child. And in some cases, the parents were not even literate. They didn't know how to read, so they couldn't read to the child, but they could encourage the child. And they could understand that the parenting style had an effect. And the amazing thing to me is that a fairly short-term intervention of that sort had long-term consequences. It had consequences in, in dim several dimensions, including educational attainment uh, in terms of uh, uh, reduced crime, but also in terms of enhanced earnings and employment. So I think it's not just a passive question. Most of the parents accepted this. They accept it. Now, you have to have subtlety. You have to have parent. You need to make sure that these programs that offered are ones that parents want to accept. So that has to have cultural sensitivity. And for very disadvantaged populations, that can be an issue. But I'm not so pessimistic about the fact that, that those programs can be implemented, because they have been. There are examples. And there are ongoing examples, both in the United States and Ireland, and then in these less developed areas. Thank you very much. The next question. For the mid and older employees, what program can the company provide? What is the role of the government to enhance the skills of the middle-aged, higher-age employees? One of the lessons that's learned from uh, skill development is that um, skills are easier to acquire the, older you, uh, the younger you are, and it gets harder and harder the older you are. But I think we can still teach resilience. There's still a lot of methods that can be taught and, uh, and coping. So there are plenty of programs. I'm probably less familiar with those programs, but certainly at least through the adolescent and late early adult years, Programs that are essentially promoting non-cognitive and social emotional skills have real effect. But at later life programs, retraining programs uh, offered to motivated workers can be quite effective. But then there's an issue, and, and this is where social policies can't operate in isolation. You could offer a worker two years short of retirement a retraining program, but very few rational workers would say, why should I retrain if I'm gonna retire? Why don't I just take my current wage or do what my current employment is? So you need to change the larger structure of society and, uh, and, and allow maybe more flexible retirement ages to allow people and middle-aged people, because there is a diminished incentive. If I'm a middle-aged or advanced age worker near or at the end of retire my working life, then the incentive to acquire those skills is badly diminished. And in that case then, it would be a rational response. So you might say, well, maybe you want more flexible hours and more flexible retirement periods. So we, one of the revolutions that's occurred in macroeconomics, I think, um, and is, uh, is a debate that's actually posted now by uh, Lars Lundquist and uh, Tom Sargent, is uh, the new way we think about labor supply. And one of the ways of thinking about career flexibility with expanded lifetimes and, and retirement and that one of the dimensions we want to do is thinking about skill enhancement programs for older workers that allow them to make the transition 
to new skills, to new occupations. But recognizing, I think, and this is a fact, that older workers typically acquire, especially the more highly uh, uh, challenging skills, cognitive skills, these skills at a somewhat lower age, at lower rate. And so what that means is that uh, they may be less efficient from a purely cost-benefit calculation. That figure I put up about early versus late comes to bite. But it doesn't mean that some of those investments can't be productive. And for very advantaged, I mean, for highly motivated, very able professional workers, we know that voluntary participation in retraining programs like recertification and accounting, engineering, law, those pro people are taking those programs and, and medical professions to keep on the profession and keep current. So I think offering those as a, as a part of the menu would be relevant. But then this notion of dynamic complementarity comes into play. That if you're not highly motivated, you're not very able, and learning new things is very difficult, offering the opportunity to learn is not going to be a very inviting opportunity, and many might not participate. So. Thank you very much. This is a relevant question. This is going to be the last question. So in your experience, what is the key to your continuous passion in your research? Continuous passion? <laughs> well, I think it's, uh, I enjoy this. I mean, uh, <laughs> this is a very interesting question, though. And I think, no, and this is it. If you think of the last 100 years, and think about, the, I mean, I'm not 100 years old, by the way. <laughs> but if you look back at the way social policy was formed, 100 years ago, I think that most educated people, Bertrand Russell, uh, George Bernard Shaw, some of the most educated and influential people of their day were eugenicists. They believed that human differences were largely created by genetic endowments, that some people were born smart and were born dumb. And therefore, there was a notion that there were these classes, these social classes. And, and there were a lot of social theories. So it's called social Darwinism in some circles, that basically there were these classes of people. And there was even a fear that the, that the dumb were reproducing at a higher rate than the, uh, than the, um, than the uh, smart. And therefore, the population of the world would decline in quality. That was the fear. But that was a view that had a very static view about how human skill was formed. The view was somehow that we were born with these traits. And so I think the Adam Smith, Fukuzawa view is probably the more optimistic view, and it has a real factual base to it. These skills, even IQ, can be acquired. If we intervene early enough, we can promote IQ. In less developed countries, where children grow up with uh, you know, a very low IQ uh, because they have no iron and zinc and some of the micronutrients, we can avoid that. We can give them. And so to me, what's the great change that's occurred is that we are thinking much more flexibly about what ability is, whether or not genetics play a big role. Now, go forward to 1970. In the United States, there was an enormous controversy. This came Arthur Jensen. And this came with the analysis of Head Start. Arthur Jensen put up some, looked at the first stage analyses of the Head Start program, an intervention that was introduced by, uh, in the Great Society of Lyndon Johnson. And he found, as many pro others had found, but the Westinghouse Corporation actually had found in an initial analysis that Head Start did not promote IQ in the first few years. So there was a fade out. It boosted IQ initially, and then it faded out. So Jensen said, we need to change the educational system. We have these people who are very dumb, and uh, they're not very good, and we should just take them. An extreme view of Jensen was uh, the bell curve by, Arthur, uh, by Charles Murray and uh, his, uh, his, uh, his co-author. Who is his co-author? Uh, uh, Hernstein. Yeah, Hernstein. Hernstein and Murray. And there, they suggested a genetic view of intelligence, that intelligence was, this was in 1990s, that a genetic view of intelligence was very important. Intelligence played a huge role in determining the, the successful and the unsuccessful, and that what we should do is recognize that as the society was getting more technically challenged, there were this group of dumb people who never would catch up. So he, they talked about actually creating reservations like Indian reservations in the US, places to put the dumb, protect them, feed them, take them away from all of us. 
And I think what we've really come to understand that that point of view is just wrong factually. It's not a question of passion. I mean, it's not that I, it's not that I make this up out of uh, thin air, that we've come to understand that these abilities can be created, these capabilities can be created, and to me that it creates a much richer view of social policy. So you look at inequality among human beings and you say, yes, we can do something about it. And we can then offer opportunity. Oh, I think that's very challenging. But the most interesting thing from a purely personal standpoint is understanding this very interesting question of how we develop as human beings. I mean, that's a very interesting question for all of us. All of us have developed in our lifetime. That process is not fully understood but we understand much more than we did. We're understanding much more as the biology, the neuroscience, the economics, sociology, psychology all come together. And to me, that's just very interesting. And the fact that these things are coming together, you get a counterpart to the biology in the economic analysis and that you can do something with it. So it's not just a question. So it's idle curiosity, if you will. I find it very compelling. <laughs> but it's like I tell yeah. graduate students. Graduate students say, what should you work on? I say, oh, something you can't stop working on. <laughs> and that's, I've kind of taken that lesson to heart. So. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your kind participation. This is the end of the special uh, program by uh, Professor Heckman, Creating Capabilities by Reity. Thank you for your kind participation. <laughs>